it's really nice to see some faces and I look forward to at the end answering any questions. So please feel free to store them up to the end and I'll do my best to answer. And if I don't know the answer, I will research for you and try and find it or send you somewhere to help you. So don't be shy at the end to ask anything and I'll do my best. So first of all, I want to say an enormous thank you. Um, taking time out is a very precious thing. I know time is a real, the precious, most precious commodity in lots of ways. Um, and particularly if you are, if you have an illness yourself or if you are a parent or carer, then we really do make lots of, have to make lots of choices in the day about how we spend our time. So for you to choose that, to spend time listening to me and meeting up with each other, I'm really hoping that you will see as the weeks go on, whether you join just for one or you do the whole series, the, the value. And um, as the weeks go on, I will introduce different themes. And the fourth week actually is about the value of connection and why that is such an important health um, gift, really. So I'm going to park that for week four, but I want you to know that, you know, there really is some great science behind all that I'm sharing. So I think I'll start with that idea of science that and the sort of, I'm sort of flip side of two, the two sides of one coin, really, I'm joining you. The first side is from the professional point of view. So I'm a physiotherapist. Um, so I trained when I was 18 years old till I was like 22 at the London Hospital in Whitechapel. I always loved science and um, yeah, it just like felt like a good fit. So I did physiotherapy and then at sort of early 20s, I really, even in that first job after qualifying, I realized that I loved working in hospital situations, but I didn't think, and lots of the times when I was working with patients, I didn't think that I really was getting the best for them. I felt like everything was so um, one dimensional that often the whole picture and the whole patient wasn't really being looked at. And that was something that has obviously been a recurring theme, you know, 35 years on, that's why I do what I do. So I, I didn't know how that was going to pan out, but that was always in the back of my mind. And that thread was born out. Um, I went, I was born in Australia and I went back to Australia in my mid twenties for a year. And I worked with all sorts of different patients and clients for different reasons, different health situations. And when I came back to the UK, when I was about 25, 26, I, had the most great, the really great opportunity to work in, in cancer actually. And cancer was just being really transformed, how people were talking about it and how they were being treated. And I was lucky enough to get a job at Royal Marsden in, in London. And I specialized in breast cancer and then care of the dying for about three to four years. And I absolutely loved it. I loved the fact I was given freedom. I talked to people in a, a real, what we'd now call a holistic way. And um, people had seemed to have so much uh, autonomy, the patients there. And so it really reinforced to me that there's so many aspects to well-being, even when you're at your most unwell. Um, there were all sorts of things that you can do to support yourself and be supported when you have choice and knowledge. So that was the next stage. And then uh, early 30s, I fast forward early 30s, had, I managed to have two children, which was actually in doubt, but we can do the health journey a little bit later on. Um, but I did, and uh, then I trained in, in acupuncture, then uh, soft tissue release, uh, then a yoga teacher, and um, energetic healing. So I now combine all those things, and I teach in yoga classes, um, but my speciality in the last 10 years really has become stress and uh, how stress impacts the rest of other diseases, but also how you live. So that's the sciencey part and what I do. What I do is very much informed like all of us um, by who I am and my experience. And I was born, as I said, in Australia and uh, very early on um, in the first three, two, three months of life, my parents were told that I was there was something wrong with me, but no one could work out what it was. I was sort of pale, you never know it now, pale and sort of um, not thriving. And, you know, my mother was only 24 at the time. I was her second child. And, my, and they'd been in Australia for about three or four years. And I think 
you know, it was a real, really bad time for them. They didn't quite know if I was going to survive. They didn't know what was going to happen. So they came back to the UK where my mother's family were. And I was brought up here and quite early on, by the time I was six months, I was taken into the hospital and in London and I was eventually uh, diagnosed with a rare blood condition called pyruvic kinase deficiency, which means I've got hemolytic anemia. So my red blood cells, not many of them um, grow to be old enough to carry oxygen. So it's an energy, um, it's a really basically an energy illness. And uh, now, as I sit here in my late 50s, I am three organs down and with a very compromised liver and uh, reduced, um, very reduced immunity. So I'm shielding, like many of you, and have been since March the 17th or whatever. So that's my sort of health journey and all through my childhood when I was going to hospital and having things done and, it, and then two or three times in my life when I've been very, very seriously ill and wondered if I was going to survive. It, all that has informed me in, in as much that I have taken from it what I can help myself with, but also in sharing with other people. So I was really excited this year to to meet Amanda through a few variety of ways I've got to meet her. And I just want to offer, honestly, anything I can do to support people, whether they are struggling with ERE themselves or whether they are a parent. Um, I sort of, yeah, I just want to do what I can to help you. And one thing I know to be true for myself, and that's why I want to share this work, is that even in the darkest times, and a couple of years ago, I had a really bad bout double pneumonia when I was in Sydney and it was life-threatening. One thing that always, always, always brings me back is, is that sense of going inwards and just knowing that a few tiny things might bring a bit of hope back. And one of those things is breath work. And I'm gonna share a breath practice in a minute with you. I wanna make these practical sessions so you have tools and whether you're the person with the illness or whether you are the carer, it doesn't matter, honestly, in terms of we all need to support our stress systems. Reason being, if you think of a computer and you have a screensaver and then you have the windows that pop up, if you think of your stress system, your day to day, how the, how the running of it is going, if you think that you could change your screensaver, from a say volcanic explosive situation to something calmer and more relaxing. If I offered you that, you can see how the whole picture of what you bring up and superimpose on that screensaver will change. And that's exactly the same in our bodies. You know, I can't change my diagnosis, you know, best one in the world, but how I manage it and how I navigate the symptoms that come I want to be in as much power and to be coping with that in the best way possible. And I was reflecting before I came on the things that having a rare disease has taught me. And the first thing I think it, it really, really, my journey has been, has been one of vulnerability, of being able to feel like really quite well and just, just getting on with life. And then in 24 hours, as it happened in 2018, completely flawed and in high dependency unit. So there is a vulnerability for all of us in this Zoom room together. And that vulnerability can sometimes make you feel so frustrated and angry and all those emotions. But at the same time, that vulnerability can become a strength as well. You can really dig deep when, you, when you're open about your vulnerability and you ask for support, then it can become a real turning point for you. So that's one just thought just to ruminate. Another thing I think that I remember very young feeling, and I think sure I would hear if I spoke to you individually, I'm sure you'll all have stories when you feel like another V, you've lost your voice at times. I don't mean literally, I mean metaphorically. But you know, when doctors have taken it from you, when systems, when administration, when the frustration of going round in circles, you just don't feel like anyone's listening. You're not heard, no one's listening. 
it's taken me nearly 60 years, I think, to find when I can sit with my specialist and have an honest conversation and feel like he's actually even taking, he hasn't already decided what I've got to do next in his eyes. So vulnerability and voice are two things. And then I think if we give a third V, so we remember vision, I think we, it's so important. We all know how important goals are. And it's really hard in this COVID time because the, the ground is moving the whole time. We think we're going somewhere. This is the same for everybody. And then there's a new lockdown or there's a new this or there's a new that. But to have a sense of a vision that even when it gets disrupted. So I was actually my finals when I was 21, when I was had to be blue lighted that night for the first time to hospital. And I was in heart failure then. And, you know, my vision was to be a physio and my vision was, and, uh, you know, obviously for quite a few months that didn't look like that was gonna happen. And then things turned around and I could regroup with my vision. So that's encouragement to the younger members as well to keep hold of a vision. And it might not seem possible in this moment because you're having a bad time or it's a particularly acute phase. But just keep it, it's the thread that you can keep coming back to. Um, and in a way, I just want you to trust me on that because it really, really does sustain you. So that's something enough of, of the talk um, about me. And I want this to be about you, but Amanda did ask me to give some background. So I hope that's been helpful. So next, I want to talk to you about stress and unhealthy stress. So stress gets a bad rap, really. Um, and a lot of stress is actually, can be good. It helps us perform. If you talk to athletes or, you know, anyone doing a big uh, presentation or something, you want a little bit of stress. You want that little bit of adrenaline but because you want to perform. You want to be at your best. That sort of stress is a short burst moment and then it dips away and you go back, in theory, to an even balanced state of your nervous system. However, I'm sure most of you, like me, don't recognize that, and particularly in times of, you know, real struggle, when illness is rife, when you've hit COVID stuff, everything else that's going on, when you're tired, when you've had infection, when you're not eating well, all those things, what happens in the body is it goes into sustained stress. And we're not designed to manage sustained stress. Our stress system is designed to get us out of danger fast. So like the lion, you know, the old story, you know, the lion's coming down the field and you like, oh my God, how do I get out? You run, 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 run up a tree or something, you're out of it. In that running, in that activity, what is happening to your physical body is that you're getting all the cortisol and adrenaline away from the non-essential areas like digestion, areas of your fertility system, those sort of things. And the energy is going into your muscles, to your heart and to your brain to keep you alive. So that is what is needed. Now, ideally you're up the tree, the lion's decided to go off and chase somebody else. Your heart rate restores, your breathing restores and your whole body system come back to a balance to what's called the rest and digest system. That counteracts the fight and flight that you've just been in. And that's how we are intended to live from a nervous system point of view. So we have a burst of something and then we restore. Unfortunately for most of us, life isn't like that. And it's the drip feed of stresses that build up. So it, rather than a burst, it becomes like that dripping tap that just keeps dripping a little bit more cortisol, a little bit more adrenaline and your body thinks it's still under attack. And so if you're not factoring in things that give you rest and digest, then you can see how the body's level of stress just starts to rise and rise and rise. And I'm sure we've all had the experience where it's not, it's risen and risen and risen. And then someone does something quite minor. Maybe, you know, they don't wash up their plate or whatever happens, I don't know. Haven't taken the dog out when you've asked them five times. And you just lose it. And that's because your threshold is, this, is a physical thing what's happened. Your threshold has got to the point where it takes less to trigger. 
So all that I'm gonna share with you in the next four weeks are all little tips and tools that just keep bringing that strength, those stress levels back to a greater sense of balance. So your health, and particularly when you're in rest and digest more, it is well known that your immunity is higher. Your digestive system works so much better. So there's all sorts, you sleep better. Your heart rate is more even. So there's all sorts of positives around whatever your situation, whether you perfectly well or not, it is important that we get some ownership and become masters again of our stress system and we don't let it run our lives. So hopefully that illustrates and now I, what I really want to do is actually make it practical because I'm very much about the practical. So park the knowledge. Any questions, as I say, I'll be around at half past eight onwards for the next 15 minutes or so to answer. And you can always store them up or you can email. But now I want you to sort of park intellect and mental processing and return to your body. So find your comfiest seat. And even if you're lying down and you're on the sofa, just consciously choose rather than just sort of drifting off, consciously choose to position your body so you have some body awareness. And then just close your eyes. And if you're not comfortable closing your eyes, just have a downward glance or gaze. And take a breath. And just notice yourself as you sit. Notice your body as it takes this position on a seat, on a sofa, on a chair, on the floor, whatever you've chosen, on a bed. Just notice everything you can about your body. Feel your feet, notice them in the position you've chosen. Feel your lower legs, the bones that go from your knees to your ankles, your tibia and fibula. Just drop those lower legs. Just make them feel heavy. Allow them to let go. Notice your upper thighs and your hips. And now come to your sit bones deep inside your bottom. Your sit bones that are deep, deep, the bones that are connected in your pelvis that you're sitting on and feel into those sit bones. Ground them into the seat that you're sitting on. Feel like they're tent pegs and they're really penetrating down into the earth, or into the seat. So you feel very present. And then notice your spine and allow your spine to find a nice gentle curve in your low back. Find some length from your base all the way to the crown of your head. Notice how your spine feels tonight. And then spread your attention outwards to your right shoulder and your left shoulder, your right arm and your left arm, all the way to the tips of your fingers and your thumbs. And let your arms drop and be heavy and really relaxed. Take a breath. And sigh out. And then take your attention and come to your heart. And as you rest and just sit in your heart, in this space, in the center of your chest, just bring to mind, not a big thing, just a small stress, a small stressful situation that you have going on at the moment. Can be anything. Just one you know that's just getting to you a bit. So we're not gonna stay there for long, but just notice it. Notice how your body responds to this stress where there's tightness, just notice. Then forget that and just park it. Take a breath into your nose, a big sigh out. 
And now, resting in your heart, bring to mind someone you really love. That if they walk through the door now, you just want to give them a big hug. Might be a person, might be an animal, whatever. Might, be, might even be a place you love. Somewhere you could go now, you just feel so liberated if you were there. Something you love or somewhere you love. And let that feeling spread and notice in your body where you feel that, that sense of ease. Take a breath into your nose and a big sigh out. Good. And just before you open your eyes or take your gaze back up, just be curious as you feel into your body and you explore it, just like it's a map, which it is in a way. And just notice anywhere in your body that you feel you carry stress mostly. We often have our areas, we know, shoulders are common, heads, eyes, necks, just you know, just dive into your body and notice where it feels tight or tense or holding where the tissues just feel like they've, they've just got a lot going on. And take a breath. And as you breathe out, release that area of your body. Actively release it, soften it, breathe into it. Whatever you need to do, just give it some love and attention and time. Do that a couple more times, focusing on this area of your body, breathing into it, Releasing it as you breathe out, letting go. One more time. Just notice how that feels. Then slowly come back into the here and now. Rub your hands together strongly and make a nice warm friction sort of feeling between the palms of your hand and then put that warmth anywhere on your body that just feels tight and tense and needs a bit of love and attention. I want to give you a tool tonight so you can practice it and maybe, you know, we can discuss how it goes next week. But the tool I want to give you tonight is called the belly breath. And the belly breath is just one of the most important things you can do for your stress system. Because when you breathe in your belly, what happens is you restart the rest and digest nervous system. You can't breathe with ease into your belly and stay stressed. So it's a great tool. I start every day just with six breaths in my belly and it just resets your system. So I want us just to all have a try of that. And then I'll do, I know I'm going to go over about five minutes, but we started a bit late. So, and then I'm just going to do a brief relaxation in line. So let's all lie down on your backs with your knees bent up. And if you're on a sofa or something already, then just stay on it and just bend your knees. You can always put cushions under your knees, guys, you know, make yourself comfy. The reason to bend your knees is it takes the pressure off your hip flexors. And so your belly can move with greater ease. So I'm gonna stay in sitting so you can see me. But rest your hands on your belly, on the area just below your belly button and above your pubic bone, so above your pelvis, that low belly. And just let your hands be soft and your elbows out to the sides. And again, you can shut your eyes or just have a soft gaze. And without changing anything, just notice how your body is feeling in this position and how the belly is moving tonight with breath, without changing anything. Where do you find breath tonight? Is it in your upper lungs, in your rib cage, or does it feel like it's actually making its way down to the belly? So just feel into the movement.
And when you're ready, just gradually bring your awareness to your nose and breathe in through your nose. And then sigh out through your mouth, a little open sigh, letting go. On the next breath in, see if you can take the breath down to your belly, a little bit, bit lower than you normally would. And as you breathe in, see if you can raise the belly up towards the sky. And as you breathe out, the belly softens and goes back towards your spine. Sometimes this feels counterintuitive. Don't overthink it. Just keep going back to the movement. Breath in, belly rises and expands and opens. Breath out, belly falls all the way back towards the spine. Don't try too hard. Just allow the breath to come in like an invitation. Breath comes in, belly rises, expands. Breath goes out, belly falls. And let's go. Just do three more rounds in your own time. Breathing in, belly rises. Breathing out, belly falls. A little tip if you're struggling to know if there is any belly breath there, is to put one hand on your heart and one hand on your belly and just see if you can get more breath in the belly than the heart hand. So if you want to try that for the next couple of rounds, give that a go. And don't worry if it's difficult to achieve. Sometimes it takes a good few days to get the hang of getting breath down into your body deeper. This belly breath serves to ground you. It calms you. It brings you back into this rest and digest that we're searching for. So just make the next round, you can practice this obviously yourself after tonight, but just make the next round the last round. And then rest your hands away from your sides and let your breath come back to whatever is a normal pattern for you tonight. You have a choice now whether to keep your knees bent and supported, or if they're not fully supported, now is the time to lengthen your legs away from you so they're straight, your legs are wide, wider than hip width, and your arms away from the sides, your sides with the palms up. If you have a blanket and you want to cover yourself so you're nice and cozy or put a little pillow or cushion under your head, feel free to do that. Just allow your whole body, your whole body now, to let go and be supported by the floor or the sofa or the bed, wherever you're lying. Take all your attention to the back of your body to your heels, right and left, to your calves, right and left, to your buttocks, right and left. Pull your toes up with your legs straight, pull your toes up towards you and feel the stretch in the back of your legs. Strong stretch now, pulling those toes up, really pulling those toes up towards your face, keeping the legs straight on the ground. Take a breath, breathe in and as you breathe out, point those toes away from you, strongly away from you. And then breathe out and let go and let your legs just find some relaxation. As you travel up, squeeze your bottom, just squeeze your bottom underneath you. So you just lift slightly from your lying posture, squeeze and hold three, two, one, and now release and let go. Travel up your back and just feel the contact of your low ribs, middle back, your shoulder blades, the back of your shoulders, and the back of your arms, all letting go on the floor, bed, sofa, however you're lying. Just really let the back of your body Spread and find ease now. Travel up the 
little loop, your beautiful little curve of your neck till you find the back of your skull being supported. Just feel that connection, the back of your head, the weight of this strong mind, this heavy head that takes quite a lot of effort to keep up. Just pray, take a breath now and as you breathe out, let the heaviness of the head fall back. Really be heavy, really be supported. Travel over the front of your face and fill your eyes, and your nose and your mouth and screw your face up really tightly now, like you're wringing out a cloth. Really squeeze, 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 squeeze. Even doesn't matter how funny you feel you look, it doesn't matter, no one's looking. Squeeze, squeeze so all those muscles are tight and then breathe out and really let those muscles relax. Particularly the jaw. Separate the teeth a little bit, the lips, relax the jaw. Take a breath. Big sigh out. Let that sigh take you down towards your heart space. Just breathe into that heart space. Breathe in a loving connection with a person or a pet. And just feel that wave of ease coming back into your heart. Travel down to your ribs at the front, to your belly, where you did that wonderful breath, down through your hips, to the big thigh muscles, over your knees, to your lower legs, your shins, into your front of your ankles, down into your toes, big toe, second, third, fourth, fifth toes. Take a breath in. Release your legs even more. On the next breath in, take your attention to your arms. And as you breathe out, let go of your thumbs, index, middle, ring, little fingers. Let your arms and hands completely surrender to the floor. Let the whole of your body now, the whole of your body be supported. There's nothing you need to do. Nothing needs to be switched on, on high alert. Let all of you let go. Let the breath come and let the breath go. Don't interrupt it. Don't alter it. We're just going to have one minute here. Resting your attention in your heart space. Just allowing every cell in your body, every cell, to be refreshed. Start to take slightly deeper breaths in through your belly and a few deeper sigh outs. Start to feel what it's like to animate your body again, to notice the bones and the muscles, the tissues. Take a big breath and on the next big breath, just see, be curious. In your own time, even if you're sharing the room with someone and doing this practice with somebody, just still have your own journey. When you're ready, just have a big stretch above your head, maybe your arms along the sofa or along the floor and legs long and away from you. Really big stretch, find your length. Take a breath there. And then as you breathe out, recoil back to your natural position. And if you're lying now on one, more on one side, just roll over so you're actually on one side. Roll over to one side if that's safe and, and don't fall off the sofa or anything and then gradually push yourself up into sitting. 
And just before we finish together this practice, I want you to find your way very, very gently, very slowly into a comfortable upright sitting posture. And feel back into your body, to the bones, to the weight of the bones, to your beautiful skeleton. And just notice, come back to body awareness, which is the key to make choices, different choices, is by having awareness. Because if we don't start with awareness, then we've got nowhere to go. We just go back to old patterns. So let's just thread that thought through as a final thought. Just have some awareness now as you sit. Awareness of your body, awareness of your thoughts, awareness of your heart's connection. And just give yourself a sort of metaphoric pat on the back for factoring in some relaxation tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining the practice. If you feel quite zombified, I would recommend strongly you rub your hands together, create some heat. It's good to put heat or tap on your head is a good way to bring yourself back. If you want to come back into the here and now, you might just want to drift off and you know stay in that super relaxed state. That's one of the reasons I like doing this sort of work this time of night is you can get the benefit of it. <laughs>